is presenting to their acceptance of their kid. Um, because, you know, unconditional acceptance is unconditional acceptance. But if you feel like, no, actually, I think that, that what you're doing is putting the salvation of uh, your salvation and the salvation of all of us in the family in jeopardy, right? That becomes a very different sort of conversation. Um, so we're interviewing uh, both parents and kids about that. And a lot of the parents that, you know, we have started out with are generally more accepting. They ended up at Encircle because they wanted resources and support. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things that is sort of troubling, and so those parents have sort of ended up in an accepting place, but often the, 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 uh, the thing that finally kind of is the straw that breaks the camel's back and pushes them toward acceptance is having their child really, uh, um, you know, almost die you know, um, suicidal or self-harming or um, depressive episodes that were bad enough, you know, to end up in the hospital. It's like, well, then once it gets bad enough, then the parents are like, oh my God, wait, let me really think about this and what is going on? And it's like, wow, does it have to get that bad before um, you can sort of help a family navigate that really tricky line, you know, between them staying true to their faith and them communicating love and acceptance uh, for a child that according to the faith does not exist. Mm -hmm. so those are really, really tricky conversations. And we're hoping that by honing in on the things that they recall as being particularly difficult or meaningful, the things that change their mind, you know, can we create resources that are specifically designed for Mormon families dealing with this, that will specifically address the things about their experience that are very unique and, and maybe provide a sort of better bedrock foundation for um, support in this community. Wow, which, could, which would be invaluable for so many religions and groups and um, so you're focusing on that because you're in Salt Lake. Yeah, and population. And that was our, our thinking all along. We're like, if you can figure out a practice, a way to open up the conversation so that you invite them to share those things, you communicate absolute respect for that faith tradition as ridiculous as you, so that you can actually have a very real honest conversation about, well, if that's what you're most afraid of, you know, because of this scripture, okay, what kind of information do you need? Or now let's let's walk through the, the process of having to deal with that discomfort. What do you want to do? Do you want to seek out more information? Do you want to talk to other parents? When those feelings come up, what should you do? You know, how should you behave? And um, yeah, so it's... Okay. It was hard enough for me, my mother passed away um, shortly after, I, er, before I came out, but I told my father, totally understanding, accepting man, it was hard enough for me to tell him <laughs> that I was a lesbian. And I, I, so I think about all the, I just have total respect and empathy for the people that you're working with because, um, you know, younger people, trans issues, I think are not as understood. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so that's fantastic. With a lot of we focused on that population because certainly the very same sort of religious problems that we're talking about are also problems with the way the church deals with same gender relationships. So it's, it's all the same kind of messed up doctrine, um, but we wanted to focus on the families with trans and non-binary kids because there's just less knowledge about that. Parents have a lot more kind of fear and confusion, like most parents kind of get what gayness is. They may be really, really confused about what their child has been trying to tell them. Mm -hmm. And so given that huge gap in knowledge and understanding, we figure anything we learn that can help this group will definitely also help, you know, other queer kids who are dealing with um, very, you know, conservative religious parents. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, will you talk to me about the, the, this is also the first time I'd heard of uh, your definition of sexual fluidity. So situation dependent flexibility in which women's, oh, in women's sexual responsiveness. Would you just, uh, just so, elaborate on your, that definition? You know, it, it's funny. We, we come up with these definitions when we're trying to describe a phenomenon in the natural world. So that phrase was me trying to find a way to describe in very clear terms what it was that I was just observing mm -hmm. on eyes and ears from the women in my study. And, and the too many words description of that would be, well, sometimes if it's the right person and the right time, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, there's a flexibility in your ability to to want to do something sexually to be aroused by that person not all the time but sometimes and you know so that was the messy phenomenon that i was trying to describe right mm -hmm. but get that way so i was like okay you know the whole point about it, it's not always it's because it's triggered by something often it's triggered by learning about something it's triggered by falling in love with someone you didn't expect to fall in love with so there's always something that triggers it. Okay, that means it's situational, right? That means it's situational. And, and so this idea of that your attractions or desires are flexible, they're not fixed, but they're flexible in response to changes in the situation. And that that's what I was trying to sort of communicate. Um, you talked about, so 2008, you talked about um, uh, has the popular um, consciousness caught up with the research? Um, where, where, do you, where do you think right now we're at? Because I, I will say, well, where do you think we're at? Let me well, tell I, you. I, let me tell I, you. What you're gonna say. Tell me what you're gonna say. <laughs> no, I, I just know I can speak for a lot of us that um, we are, I thought I was the only one that was the only person with this experience. And luckily we have all found each other and we can share common, common experiences. Um, but that, that surprises, it surprises me that there's so many of us, right? We're almost 650 in this group and that's just. Um, and I do think, I think it's absolutely generational because, and you know, when I talk to uh, folks who are 15, 16, 17, 18, they just already assume that like sexuality is fluid and gender is fluid and everything's fluid and like, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and they're kind of surprised that this is even controversial. They're like, they're like, duh. Uh, it's funny. I, I want, I had dinner, some, I think it was last year or the year before with uh, one of my best friends from high school. And we were catching up. I hadn't seen her for years and years and years. And she has, you know, a 13 year old daughter attending the same high school that we, you know, we're best friends and we're talking about this daughter. And she goes, you know, um, she came home the other day and was, was basically describing every girl in her class as they all identify as uh, sexually fluid. Like they've all talked about it, a bunch of 13 year olds. And they're like, oh yeah, totally. You, me, yes, also, yeah. And, and so my friend, Charmaine, said, she said to her daughter, okay, you know the woman who's gonna have dinner with us tomorrow? Do you know like the only reason that you're even saying that is because of her? Like, you know, do, that's, that's the woman you're gonna be having dinner with. And then, she, and then when I was over, she was like, did you do this? Did you do this to my child? <laughs> and like, you know, seven eighths of the, of the class, they're all identifying as sexually fluid. And so, I think it just shows that there is a generational shift in what people think is normal versus abnormal. Mm -hmm. And um, we're at this historical juncture where in the generation of queer people in which I came out, um, you know, terms like lesbian and bisexual and heterosexual in their clearly defined articulated definitions, that's what everybody sort of used. 
And that's why it was so perplexing to me when some of the women in my study were like, I don't really want to label my sexuality. I'm like, what does that mean? I'm like, I love my label. Right? And but now none of the young kids want anyone to label them anything, right? Which to some degree is just freaking great. But, you know, but it's amazing to me. I'm like, wow, you have no idea what it took to get there. You know, that adopting a label is a true free choice because you can decide whether to communicate your sexuality in that way. You can decide not to. And there's enough diversity out there that it can actually be a free choice and not something that you feel um, was sort of the price of admission. Mm -hmm. Do you think those same young people when, uh, because I have a 17 year old bonus, bonus girl from um, my wife's daughter and uh, it, it, it's some of the stuff that I talk about, it, it, you're exactly right. It's like, well, that's not a big deal. That's just, you know, normal. It, it's in the zeitgeist, right? In, in high school, high school kids now. One of those kids married two man for 30 years. So 30 years from now, and then they, switch switch you know is is it the late is it the length of time is it the is it that we are adults um m mothers with children people don't expect that what do you think is going to happen with do you do you anticipate that it's only going to get better for them or do you think th what's the stigma around our particular ages and and being well, mothers? It's a great question and there really is like no answer to it. There is something about our culture um, that just thinks that uh, anything that occurred when you were a child is authentic and anything that emerges later than that is somehow a sort of false representation. So this like early development. Yeah, yeah. Like why? There's no there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's sort of like a part of folk wisdom, you know? And yeah, so I, I don't know what to say about that. It's, it's one of those things where people have their kind of lay wisdom, their lay folk psychology that may or may not have any basis in anything, but those are hard notions to shake. Mm -hmm. They just are. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a researcher. I deal uh, more with the feeling, the feelings, um, but I, I think a lot has to do with the fact that in that for mothers, I'll just speak specifically about mothers, not all of us are mothers, but um, that a mother identifying as a certain sexuality that maybe isn't, you know, not had cis normative hetero, you know, marriage, um, and then, or being in a hetero marriage and then changing, it's like, no, you can't do that mm -hmm. because you're, that's a sexual thing. Yeah. And you're a, and also, it's like, about selfishness. Like how, how dare a mother ever put any of her needs above the status quo? Like how selfish are you? Mm -hmm. You're going to do that. And for, because nobody wants you to do it. So the only reason you're doing it is because it makes you feel good. You're, like, you're not allowed to feel good. A mother's life is sacrifice. She's not allowed to have her own desires. Mm -hmm. Now that goes back, you know, millions of years. Sure. Yeah. Um, I said after 15 and I didn't, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to open it up because I know I see nodding and I know people have, or I, I think people have some questions or even if you just want to um, say something to share something with Lisa, I open it up. And if not, I can still keep going and ask questions because this is fast, fascinating to me. Susan. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for writing this book. Like, Oh wait, um, sorry, uh, Susie. And then Susan, you'll be next. Susan B. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 Susie, it's fine. There's, there's two of you. So Susan, you're next. Susie, go ahead. I like make nicknames up on the spot. So, <laughs> so anyhow, thank you so much. Like, you know, I, I always felt like I had to be in one category or the other. I'm like, well, I'm not straight. I'm not full lesbian. I guess I have to be bi, but I'm not 50-50. And like the idea of like sexual fluidity and I, you know, I don't even need a label. I'm like, wow, I don't have to force myself into a category. And that's, 
in the last two weeks, it's really like kind of blown my mind and been life changing. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. That means so much to me. I mean, that's, that's just, a, that's exactly why I wrote this book, you know, uh, and that, that means a great deal to me. Go ahead, Susan. Okay. So I am so ha happy that you're speaking with us tonight. I was born intersex in 1958, and I, I've, it's been really difficult for me. And my experience in my lifetime is that gender absolutely, in my experience, is fluid. And I had corrective surgery when I was 15, and I mean, it's just so comp. I remember as a young child not knowing who I, what I was, you know, and this, you know, I'm a boomer. So uh, I'm part of the group that you described at the beginning of your talk as being very, you know, set and defined. And I, just to finish, I, um, I really don't like labels. And I, I actually, piggybacking on what Susie just said. I, I don't feel like I fit in anywhere. Thank you for sharing that, that um, I'm, I'm touched and honored by your willingness to share something so personal. Um, and I do think that we have a society in which not knowing the answer to something is the most anxiety producing thing possible. We don't have a culture that embraces the ultimate impossibility of certitude. No, in our culture, if, if something is uncertain, then everyone's in danger. And, and there's an inability to sort of sit with ambiguity and a need to resolve this question. Um, and that I think is part of why it is difficult for individuals who prefer not to have labels to sort of exist in this culture that's constantly sort of saying, there must be something wrong with you if you don't have a 100% goal-clad certainty understanding of every aspect of your self, you know? Um, I sort of think it's a more exciting way to think about the human condition, to think about a joy in going through your life wondering what else you don't know about yourself mm. else you're going to discover oh my gosh what's next what comes next after that that kind of seems like a more joyful way to experience life is to say i don't know everything yet thank goodness because what i do know i'm kind of bored with right to have this sense of that there is newness and internal revolutions uh, and turning things upside down, that all of that can always be yours. You can feel the way you did as a 13 year old learning how to you know, ride a bike, that that sort of feeling of discovery, uh, in order to have the exhilaration of discovery, you do have to sit with a certain degree of, of anxiety about, wow, I don't know all the answers. You need that anxiety to, to give you the reward when you make these discoveries. So, you know, there's a tension between the security of knowing and the excitement slash anxiety of, of, of not knowing exactly what the future holds. Thank you. And we do that with politics. We do that with religion. We do that with, um, you know, lots of fields and things that we want to keep expanding and growing and changing, but it doesn't seem that there's room for, you know, sexuality. And it, it, it was such a great, it hit me when you said that about, well, we trust like a seven-year-old to say, um, I like girls or I'm gay or, you know, but we don't trust a 48-year-old that would say the same thing. So, Sex is just, it, it, it's just one of those non, it, it, so yeah, non-flexible seems to be non-flexible. You know, there's this, you know, I want, sometimes wonder, I'm like, it's just because 
the United States like watches a lot of movies that everything has to have a strong narrative thread. And so that the moment that uh, something about your pattern of sexuality changes, so you fall in love with someone you didn't expect to fall in love with, then you go back and you look back at your whole history and you rewrite it so that it makes a nice story. Oh my. Well, yeah, yeah, I had two kids and yeah, I did this, and, but I was repressed the whole time because that somehow is easier for people to believe and cope with than you know that that we're always eternal but sometimes we're not aware of it you know when the actual truth uh, that that life is a journey that that you know we're on the, on the car and we often don't know where it's going that's a more unsettling truth so it's easier for people to go and look back at their history and retell themselves a story that made the current moment feel inevitable versus saying, wow, sure didn't expect that. What's gonna happen in the future, right? That for a lot of people is so deeply terrifying. Can we, can, can you all? Relate. That, that was my reaction when I realized I was gay. I was like, wow, didn't see that coming. <laughs> and then I laughed. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Did you do that thing, Robin? I'm going to put you on the spot. You don't have to answer. But did you do that thing that Lisa's talking about that, well, looking this back. To make sense? This has to well, be. I, I did. Well, I think we all look back backwards and say, okay you know, did I have any crushes? Like what, you know, I, I think everyone here has looked back and questioned, you know, where did I veer off the, uh, you know, where, and, and for me, interestingly, um, and Lisa, you may find this, I, I can't come up with an answer for myself other than um, when I was eight or nine years old, I, I believe I had a crush on my tennis teacher. Um, I knew that there were some kind of feelings there going on. Then my mom died when I was 10. And I really believe her death made me take the, the turn in the why in the road, you know, that, that maybe things would have been different for me sexually, because after that I was, you know, I was a goner for a long time. You know, I was really sleepwalking through life. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, that's the only thing I can come up with was how, how this got suppressed. Um, but yeah, I, I think all of us look back and say, were there any breadcrumbs that I could have followed? You know, like what? <laughs> but yeah. but I, I, I'm just happy to be here. I'm like, okay, I just accept it. I, have, I have a question. How many of us knew when we were children that we were going to be who we are now? I knew when I was eight that I was transgender and I didn't act on it until I was 14. But when I did act on it, the doctors then thought I had a form of mild schizophrenia. So they gave me electric shock treatment. Wow. That was 1974. Interesting, and my what? mother got electric shock treatment because for her depression and alcoholism. And it was around, they, she died in 71. Interesting. They did this. They did this to me, I was 14 years old, twice a week, and gave me shots of Thorazine every 18 hours oh at 14 God. years old oh, for four okay. months. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Yeah. I mean, like, I after I got, the, what they did was, uh, if it was in modern day, would be uh, torture me to admit I was a, a guy and I tried to man up for, uh, from 14 all the way up until when I came out when I was 49 years old. No wonder why I joined the army and became a paratrooper. And when they asked to go, do you want to go to war? I said, yeah, I went to war four times, got shot twice. Wow, wow. Well, you were probably pretty pissed off, I would imagine, Jane. I would, I would have probably felt like, you know. It's, you know, a, ter it's a terminology called you're manning up. You don't want to admit that you are mm -hmm. a girl mm -hmm. when you're, uh, you're trying to admit that you're uh, a guy and you're manning up. And no wonder why the suicide rate for transgenders is 41%. Mm -hmm. Well, in a sense, don't you think you were somewhat 
either subliminally or consciously trying to commit suicide. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's, oh my God. I mean, I hope, I hope that the reason that you had to go through that is because they didn't know what the hell, you know, I don't know, maybe not. Maybe that was a part of conversion therapy, you know? That they, I don't no, know. The, doctor, the doctor said uh, it's a form of mental illness, thinking you are the gender that you were not born as. I went, okay, what do you do? And then they put attached electrodes to my brain. I have a permanent burn going from the upper lobe to the lower right part going on a diagonal line like this where the two electrodes were. And that's why I have a speech impediment. What um where where were your parents in all of this? They were all for it. Sure. I I came from my upper middle class Connecticut family. Yeah. We don't like Lisa said, we don't like what we don't know. We we don't like that that the anxiety fear fear is always the driver. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, yeah. and another part that I didn't, that I, that, and Lisa, you speak to this um, as you're, I love that, as you're looking back and saying, well, it has to make sense. I have to make all of this make sense. To me, that's because I did that. And to me, that's so invalidated all those years. You know, I had a, I had a husband. I loved my husband. I still love the man. I mean, he's a good man. Um, but there were a lot of, you know, there's obviously a lot of issues and sexual issues, but uh, to to have to string it together and say, um, in order for this to be true, I have to let go of that story because this is the real story. There's only one real story, right? Yeah, and I think it's interesting that, you know, although many people feel deeply connected to their career, uh, we don't tend to treat career development as the same sort of thing. We don't say, well, did you always know you were a manager, right? You know, <laughs> we, we allow people to make, you know, developments and you respond to an opportunity and something is different than you thought it was going to be. And then you go here and then it goes over there and then it goes over there. We sort of embrace that, that over your life, you are, you can be more than one thing. I was an architect and then I was a painter, right? But with sexuality, there's this assumption that can only ever be one thing. If you're an architect now, you were born an architect. Does the, uh, Mila, you're up and- Oh, I was just gonna say like on that thread, um, so I actually was Mormon and I left the Mormon church seven years ago. And this kind of came up when I left Mormonism. Everyone was like, well, how can you just leave this? Uh, my family and friends and everyone from that religion. And I was like, like, so you just don't, you didn't, all those things that you did and you, you don't love it anymore. You didn't believe it at the time. And I was like, no, when I did those things, I loved it and I believed it. And I, I did enjoy it when I was doing it at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't discredit it. I didn't go back in time and like say, well, when I had my five kids, I, I love them now. I don't discredit that happening or those times in my life, but I grew and I changed what I believed in. It doesn't make those things less valid for those times in my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm not like angry about it or like anything. I just, those are just a different time in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't hold like that. And so I kind of feel like this is the kind of the same thing for me. Um, in the sense that like, um, I look at my marriage with my husband is like, those were at the time that was something I thought I wanted and I thought I was enjoying, but, um, but you know, and then I was with a woman and I'm like, oh, well, this is a whole different thing. <laughs> and I really, I'm liking this in a whole different way. And I think so, um, for me, when I was listening to your talk, I really felt like it really validated that idea that just because you like change your mind about something, it, it kind of feels like almost like gaslighting sometimes when people say, well, you can't change your mind. And I'm like, but you can. And I felt that a lot. Oh, you must have known, you know? Yeah. And, well, and like my family with me not wanting me to leave my religion, like saying, well, how could you get married in the temple and then leave this church? And I'm like, well, I changed my mind. And I feel like this is kind of the same thing. Like I didn't know that I would be so romantically interested in women because I never had thought about it 
when I was younger. I'd never kissed a woman when I was younger. I didn't know. And it's so I think it's just kind of the same idea. And I, when I left religion, I discarded those boxes. And so I love the idea of not having to, I was really anxious about trying to pick a box. Like, I don't know. And I read all the descriptions. I'm like, am I pan? Am I lesbian? And, and it just gave me so much anxiety. And so I, I love the idea of being like, I don't know why do I have to pick boxes for everybody. Why does everybody need me to like categorize myself religiously and politically and everything for everybody else in our society instead of me just being like, I can I just be a human being? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so I, I really resonate. Because labels started out as ways for the community to affirm and embrace one another. So the whole point of people embracing labels was to extend and connect and make you feel good and make you feel less anxious. And so it completely defeats the purpose if that then becomes its own source of anxiety, right? It's no longer serving the purpose that labels were were meant for, which is to draw people in, to make, to calm them down, to make them feel understood and everything. And so if that tool then becomes a source of new anxiety, you know, it's like, we got to just, you know, throw it out and start all over again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, The, the, born that way when you said that in the TED talk that, that you know, became the, the, you know, anthem. But thank you, Mila. Thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, you know, my first thought is like, you can't, you can't get rid of the born. I mean, you can't get rid of born that way. That's, I mean, that's our, that's our only, that's our shtick. That's our thing. So um, what, what do you, what do you say to people that disagree? Cause, but now I'm completely obviously I'm, I understand what you're saying. It makes sense. But what's your argument to people when they um, question that or what's been the, the, um, the downfall of that or the back, uh, backlash? Has there been backlash of that? Well, I would, there hasn't really been backlash, but when I have conversations with folks and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a serviceable enough argument that, you know, get some mileage out of it, even if there are some downsides. Like it's all strategy. And if it's good strategy, it doesn't really matter. Like let's just get through the next election or whatever. Um, And, you know, my response to that is that the underlying message of the born that way argument is so demeaning that there's almost no time to waste. I mean, it is basically saying, I have this thing, this terrible thing about me, but I didn't do it. I can't help it. I was born with it. That is a, an extraordinarily demeaning and denigrating view. And so to ask the community of, of sexually and gender diverse people, that the price of their full admission to society is them embracing and agreeing with the view that, yeah, you are not a fully worthwhile human being. Yeah. But we're, you know, for that reason, we're going to, you know, give you a pass. That uh, going along with that bargain, you can have your rights as long as you agree with our view that you're worthless. Mm. It's not uh, not a reasonable bargain and no one should ever be able to trade on another person's identity. You know, to to accept that view of of yourself as, as a price for, you know, legal recognition. That's not a fair trade. Mm-hmm. One of them is procedural. The other one is really destroying your soul. And that's why you have such high rates of suicidality in queer and trans kids, right? That as long as you allow society to continue to say, yeah, you were born with something. I guess it's all right because you didn't choose it, but you've got something wrong with you. That's a toxic message. It's just toxic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and with a view to that, 
I think the downsides of the born that way approach at this point far outweigh any strategic benefits. Mm -hmm. Lives on the line, mm -hmm. you know? That's so well said. So it's sort of like the coming out and having your parents say, or someone say, oh, I, I still love you. <laughs> Which before I thought, I would have thought, oh, that's awesome. That's so beautiful that you still love them. Despite this thing, despite this thing, yes. Carrie, Carrie, give your hand up. And then uh, Amelia. It was, okay. First of all, I wanna thank you, um, Dr. Diamond. I wish I would have had your book years ago. I actually feel like I knew this in my mind. I'm 46. I think we're in the same generation. Um, I, when I was a young adult, I actually encountered two, what we now say bloomers. They didn't call themselves that. They were just two um, housewives who found each other hiking in Tucson and suddenly were lovers. And interestingly, I learned that now 20 years later, one of them has gone back and is married to a man and the other is married to a woman. So they fit right into your, um, what your book, the- Yeah, <laughs> who knows? Could have been the other way around, right? Exactly. And they were, they used to tell me I was gay. And at the time I was so confused because I wanted to say, yes, I'm gay, but I want kids. I had all these reasons why I couldn't be gay because I thought being gay was a checklist. <laughs> and I think what this, and then whenever your book and your research, it clearly had an impact because eventually I came to conclude that I was sexually fluid. I remember talking about it with my ex-husband. And I just thought, well, that explains why I fantasize about women. I don't particularly enjoy sex, but I can get through it, blah, blah, blah. But I think this born this way idea and when people seem like they can't even wrap their minds around it, I actually like coming out at this point in my life because the older you get, the more you just don't care. If they want me, great. If they don't, too bad. But, and if I were younger, I think... I mean, it was hard because I couldn't do it then. And I, I couldn't then think about, can I fit between men or women? What if I, I find some men attractive? And I see in our community of women just coming out, agonizing over this, getting so confused, like, oh my gosh, I saw this attractive man. He's really hot, but I don't want to sleep with him. What does that mean? And mm -hmm. it's so liberating to say, guess what? We were born this way. And that just means... We can feel all these things. And I hope that for other people that encounter your work and start to think about this, it will be liberating more so than oh, it's interesting. You said, you said, oh, you know, I'm reaching out to that person saying, you know, you're not the only one. I'm like this too. And we were born that way. When really the most important part of that sentence was not the born that way part. It was, you're like this, so am I. Other people are like this. So what people, what, when you want to connect with another person with an experience like that, it's not about we were both born this way. It's about we both have something in common about the wackiness of our lives. And isn't that great? Isn't it great that there's a whole bunch of folks who also have unexpected twists and turns? So that has nothing to do with, the, with where it came from, whether you were born or not. The main thing is, wow, you're not alone. You're not alone in that. I do wonder though, I get a little confused when you say sexual orientation is apart from this and maybe that is an evolving thing too, which eventually is gonna become maybe sexual orientation is maybe very postmodern, but maybe that's not even a thing. Like maybe we just are attracted to who we're attracted in the moment and the time and that's just how it is and we're not there. But um, I don't know if you had anything further to say because this- No, I. I actually think that that, I mean, you're asking questions that are actually right now uh, at the heart of very vociferous debates within the scientific community. And so let me just give you one example in terms of like, you know, when you, to, to make you aware of how much, uh, how much kind of arbitrariness there is in our in our notions of how sexual orientation works. You know, so we talk about uh, homosexual and heterosexual, that there's two types of people in the world 
there are people who are attracted to the opposite sex and people who are attracted to the same sex, and there you go. And so we have homosexual and heterosexual. Well, and an, an entirely other way to think about patterns of attraction is to say, there's two types of attractions that exist. Attractions to men, the people presenting as men, and attractions to women. Most of the people who have the attraction for men are women. Most, but not all. Most, but not all of the people who are attracted to women are men, you know, so that the major difference is people attracted to women, people attracted to men. And then it's just the proportion of men. So basically, if with a, with a little cognitive flip of the switch, you can create a whole new understanding of what even we think sexual orientation even is, right? Does that, is it same gender, other gender, or is it male, female? And so all of that leads you to a deeper and deeper distrust of, of the notion that we're carving nature at its joints, right? We observe that, you know, there are certain patterns of sexuality that recur over and over again. Wow, some people uh, report attractions to both genders and some people really only report attractions for one. So that's a real thing that exists. And so then we as humans then try to make sense of this complexity by saying, okay, it must be that, you know, most people are other gender oriented. And the, so we are always as humans trying to take the complexity that we see and make a reasonable working model that we can follow to understand the world. And those models are imperfect, but they're serviceable. And I think that is one way to think about sexual orientation as a construct. We don't know what it is. We don't know that it exists, but this idea that there are groups of people who seem to be more consistently drawn to one type of person than another is a real phenomenon we observe. And then we make up a way to understand it. And I think we're all, it's all fine and good as long as we are always aware that that is a story we're telling ourselves about the nature of the world. It is not the truth about that. It's us in superimposing a sort of boundary so we can make sense of things. I think as long as we remain aware that it's, it's a shortcut, it's a heuristic, it's not a real thing, then I think we're okay. I think the problem is that over years, that shortcut in thinking, then sort of, it's like the fake news then became established fact. And people were like, oh, there's such a thing called sexual orientation. And this is how it's structured. Because the model ran away on its own and then became like doctrine when it was never supposed to serve that function. So I find the notion of sexual orientation to be a very useful way to talk about the fact that some people appear to have a certain pattern of sexual desire and behavior that clusters, clusters together in a way that seems meaningfully distinct from other people. And so scientifically, I want to preserve that in my memory and find a way to represent that and be aware of that, right? But that's me using the notion of orientation to guide my understanding of the human condition. That's different from then saying, well, then everybody, everyone is, within one of these categories. That is a fundamental truth about you. You know, that just was never supposed to be. What a great explanation. Oh my goodness. We have five, eight minutes because I want to be respectful of Lisa's um, time. Um, Amelia, you had your hand raised. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to make a comment about the born that way argument. And there's two ways that I feel that it um, affected the speed at which I was able to come to my realization that I'm a lesbian. Um, and the first is, well, because I, you're born this way, I should have known, like I would have, I, if I was born that way, I would have known since I was a little kid. And so if, because I didn't know, well, I couldn't be a lesbian, like that can't be me. Um, and then the second way is I have an identical twin sister and she's straight she identifies as straight and so she's not a lesbian so there's no way i could possibly be 
a lesbian, if we were, if we share the genes, if you're born this way, that can't possibly be my truth. Um, and so your TED talk really resonated with me for the, those reasons. And I feel like, yeah, I, I might've come to this realization a lot earlier without it. I, I, so, I so appreciate that story and it makes so much sense. And uh, when I first started the, the research for my book and I was interviewing women, I heard so many stories that were exactly like that. People were like, well, I figured this is the kind of thing people say they know from when they were five. Well, I know that I didn't think that way when I was five. So the fact that I'm fantasizing about having sex with women now, I can totally dismiss that because if I were really gay, I would have known, right? And so that's where it's like this attempt to make sense of the world then ends up distorting people's understanding of their own experience. They're not able to trust their own feelings because they're like, well, that isn't supposed to be how it works. And I think whenever we find ourselves distrusting the truth of our own flesh and blood, you know, there's a warning sign, you know, because our experiences are experiences. They may not make sense. They may not be fully understandable, but they have their own lived truth. And there are a lot of ways women historically have been told to not pay attention to our own erotic truth. Oh, absolutely. Dot, you talked about that, about how, the, why is this uh, fluidity more prevalent in women than men? And because of the repression, a lot of the repression, and I, and I, I think the same happens to boys, but in a, in a different way. Um, when are you going to speak again? When, do you speak? Do you, I mean, do you do talks? I mean, obviously not this, not this past. So, I mean, you know, it's COVID obviously <laughs> changed that, you know, I mean, most of my day-to-day -day life is spent, you know, doing research, you know, at the, at the university, but I do, you know, and generally when I speak, I mean, the TED talk was, was unusual because of its broad reach. I mean, I do a lot of speaking for other academic, you know, departments and conferences and things like that. So most of my speaking is, you know, office const in the sort of stodgy academic world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, which we need that. Yeah, we need like, that. you know. Bless, bless you for doing that. I just want to see more. I want more, maybe, maybe selfishly, I want more people to hear what you have to say because then it explains things and I don't have to explain it. <laughs> maybe it's that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your time. I, we've been talking about this for a while and um, the, uh, it, again, again, I just feel completely uh, validated. Um, what, I don't want to say what advice do you have for us going forward, but we've sort of found each other. We're coming to our awareness about this fluidity. What, what advice do you have? Oh, like I just said, learn to, to, to check back in with your own intuition and your own, your heartbeat, you know, your, your feelings, um, instead of being like, well, whatever I just experienced, that can't be true. Like, why am I feeling fear? I'm not afraid. Why am I feeling this? I shouldn't feel that. To just actually just allow yourself to sort of mindfully just be in the full presence of your own intuition and, your, and the cues that your body and your mind are telling you and to turn that focus inward. You know, women are socialized to do a lot of giving and a lot of caregiving. And I think sometimes it helps to turn that lens back on yourself and, and listen to yourself and love yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah, well said. <laughs> Very well said. Um, I would love to um, invite you to join our group if you want to, our, our private, not social media group, if that's something you're in, you know, if you want to certainly get a lot of insights about what's happening right now with the, at least the 650 of us. Um, and I'm sure if you do further research or further, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people that would love to, um, you know, be involved with that or, um, 
you know, volunteer in some way, because uh, I know personally, I felt like how, it's why I started the group because I felt I didn't know anyone. I, I didn't have any um, information. I didn't know where to, to look. So um, now I know where to look, but I want it to be more widespread, which is why I want you up on the stage. Um, <laughs> just why I want you up on the stage again. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I have one burning question. I have one burning question. I think yes. you might be drinking something I used to drink. Are you drinking an IPA, Lisa? I am a stone. <laughs> yes. Oh, sure, IPA. Yes. I wow. know. I used to drink that right. one. That's Oregon, right? I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I don't know, but it's got a great alcohol content and a good taste. Yeah. You have good taste in beer, Lisa. Good taste in beer. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I knew it. Yeah. Lisa, I just have a quick question that uh -huh. uh, would apply to everyone, probably. What's the best way to contact you? Uh, through my email and you can find my email. My mother has informed me that if you just type Lisa Diamond Utah into Google, you'll quickly get to my webpage at the university and you'll quickly find my email. Yeah, Thank not you. even Utah, just Lisa Diamond and you you pop up everywhere. It's good that oh, you're- yeah, My mom, my yeah. mom did not test that. My mom tested it a certain way. <laughs> she wanted to know and- mm -hmm. That's her report. Yes, she's proud. She's obviously, she's proud of her daughter. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. All right, well, you have a good rest of your evening and um, appreciate this so much. Thank you again. Right. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank Bye. you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. You take a deep breath now. That was awesome. Everyone should feel so validated. Yeah. Now we just have to work on getting rid of those fears. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who, who, you guys can all unmute yourselves. Um, I'm still rec I'm still recording, so just know that. Um, what, 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 did anybody have any like ahas or moments or disagreements or? I, I simply yeah. agreed with what she said. Like um, the born this way, like I always thought that was right because that was like the category or what they use the terminology. Yeah, yeah. So, and I've heard like gender fluid, but I really didn't know what that meant. So for her to break it down, like I understood. Mm -hmm. And um, that makes me feel like I don't have to put myself in a category basically. Because sometimes like when I join the meetups for lesbians, I'm like, not sure if I should share my story because I'm not sure like if they'll like accept me because mm -hmm. I'm finding out later who I am mm -hmm. um but like just um getting on meetups with like transgenders and just like every category LGBTQ um mm -hmm. we're able to discuss it and to just um understand it more mm -hmm. and understand who I am mm -hmm. and uh what really um, I found through this journey is like what she said was loving yourself. Like, I don't think I loved myself so much until I figure out who I was. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just, you know, me being who I am. And um, yeah, just having a, a new journey in this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Natalia. Yeah, well oh, yeah. Um, I, I wonder about la the labels. I thought that Jocelyn's just getting here. I thought that, um, uh, I wonder, I wonder what, if we should put less emphasis on labels, even in the, the group. I mean, that just kind of has my head spinning about that, about that it's, um, it's like, it's res restrictive. Um, or maybe it's more about it's, it's our own individual choice. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that that's what she said is that we should be able to maybe that it should just be a choice, but more so that allowing um, yourself the option to the idea of that coming out later shouldn't be like, you should have always known that. And then like maybe that hindering people from coming out later. The idea that like, maybe you can be a lesbian today, but it was okay that you used to be married to a man. Like mm -hmm. that, it didn't, that's not yes. something wrong with that. Hannah? Yeah, I just, when she said, she was talking about like our generation or 
that our culture was seeing everything that coming from childhood as genuine and everything after that is like insincere that was just like I just like I just yeah just a second baby sorry um I just feel like that was just really it's like every like even personality test is like trying to figure out who you were as a child and returning you to that and it's yeah so I don't feel my child needs me but that was my thought that is okay I know you're right yeah it the going back to the childhood that we that that we should have known then as a child but we don't know now you know we always talk about trust yourself trust yourself but people don't even want us to trust ourselves when we're as my wife and I like to say we're grown-ass women grown-ass woman I do whatever the fuck I want to do because I'm a grown-ass woman I have it on a keychain um who else who else won't, needs to debrief Kiara are you are you are you are you good are you okay? Did I, I, I don't mean to be Snoopy, but I thought I saw you. Did, were you, did you cry a little bit? It's okay to cry. I did. <laughs> Am I always crying? I was like, <laughs> yeah, oh. chills for sure. But like, I don't know, we were just kind of talking. So this is Allie, everybody. Hi, Allie. Um, hi. <laughs> um, so we were, she was just kind of mentioning something that was, I thought was interesting. Just like the whole, like, you can explain Allie like the should have as opposed to like maybe how did you not know kind of thing right like I, I admit I said that to her I, you know looking back at some of her history and some pictures I was like you know, did she not know there was you know different patterns in her life activities things she did and and so you know, I felt it right away when I met her um but I think there's a difference between me saying you should have known which I never said or versus like, how did you not know? There, were, I saw these little patterns. So I think should is like a blaming almost that you, how did you miss that? Like you didn't know it for yourself. But I mean it more as like, there were little patterns that at least, you know, I strung together in speaking with her, but I don't mean it as you should have known. I don't think that's, you know, everyone gets there at their own time. And, and so, you know, I, I came out earlier but I would never have been like, how did I not know, even though I liked my third grade, you know, student teacher and my softball coach, but I didn't say like, I should have known. It's just a pattern of things that I figured out. But so when I say it to her, I don't mean you should have known. I meant just like, you know, oh, you missed things along the way that ended up sure. to something. Yeah. Well, and in your situation of someone being out longer, you know, or coming out earlier and, and someone coming out, coming out later, um, it is, uh, Wait, hold on. Sorry. Okay. Pause on pause on printing for just a second. Just because it's loud. That's okay. Oh, uh, yeah, can you so sorry. Family. There you go, honey. That's okay. That's all right. Um we all know that. I can do wait, hold on. I can do this. Watch. Coming out earlier, come out. Yes. I, I came back to it. Wow. Um, it is um of course you're gonna wonder. From your part from your partner somebody you're dating or whatever the situation is how they didn't know because it's scary it's really it's really scary to to um as we've all heard about lesbian chronicles and all the different things about the catalysts and all this stuff there's a lot of fear around are you going to leave or are you going to change your mind or so i, I think within our own realm that's a i think it's an okay question to to ask um, within like partners, you know, within people that are dating, because it's just about being curious. Yeah, but a woman could leave you for another woman just as much as you could leave them for another man. I mean, I think yes, yes, yeah. What I love it's about behind the should behind, which I know, Ali, you said you didn't say should. Behind it is fear. Yeah. Well, I love that my coming out when I finally decided to come out or whatever it was, cause it was always there. I look back and I see, oh yeah, that I was totally in love with that uh, girlfriend when I was in high school or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I look back at it curiously thinking, well, I just didn't know how to articulate it. So it is what it is. And yeah, I fell in love with my husband. Um, those more invalid feelings, um, but what I love about coming out now is that I've even evolved more into the world of being queer. Like I, for example, I think when it first came out, The Tales of the City, the newest version on Netflix, I watched it and I didn't fully like get all of it. 
And just because I've been on this path the last couple of years, I rewatched it recently. Like I get so much more and I am so much more open. Um, even when I started thinking about dating and the idea of, well, what if a woman is trans? What, how am I gonna react to that? And now I'm just kind of like, well, what does that even mean? Being trans can mean anything. <laughs> and you know, we're all humans and we're just gonna explore what we explore as we get there. And this idea that, it's that we've tricked people. Well, this idea that we've tricked people. I mean, you hear this a lot as it relates to trans folks. But I mean, I think that is the gay community, the lesbian community, whatever. If you don't know when you were born, you were somehow tricking people. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Mentality. Yeah. Lizzie had Lizzie, you had your hand up. I'm sorry. Yeah. And thank you, Robin, for I, I, I got a little sensory overload. I'm sorry, I missed hand. <laughs> Go, go ahead, Lizzie, and then and then Susan. And if it, it, you guys can jump jump in after Lizzie and Susan because they've had their hand raised. Um, I was just uh, I was wondering if anybody else was having complicated feelings about this because, uh, along with what Amelia was saying, the the born this way, like that being out there in the popular culture, like did keep me from even considering the fact that I might be a lesbian because I was like, oh well, I didn't know it when I was younger, so. Um, so, so I, yeah, I, I like that there's this idea of fluidity at the same time, now that I have arrived here and I did the whole looking back, but then I felt like looking back, I was like, okay, well, maybe some of those things were valid. You know, I don't know that I was like secretly in love with anybody or that because this, the conception simply wasn't there, but now that I've finally like arrived at this identity, like. I, I feel like I finally am becoming like fully who I am as a queer person. Um, so then, uh, or maybe I'm just one of the people who like, I don't want to be fluid anymore. Like I want to be here. I don't want to go. I don't want any more fluidity. Like I want this yeah. to be the final destination. Yeah. And this is your final, this can be your final destination. Right. Day. Day. And I, you know, her point is, so I get that. I get it. And her point is, tomorrow you can choose whatever you want but because you claim it today doesn't mean you you're you're bound right and she was saying that that is about fear which i'm sure it is because like you can only have your world shaken up so many freaking times before you're just like yeah. no i really need something to settle i really <laughs> i really need to just trust myself on this one I really right do. yeah and you can that's that's how that we can only trust ourselves right now in the moment because we just don't, you know, we just don't know. But yeah, you stay put, girl. Stay put. <laughs> stay put. Lesbians. I love that because I just watched Bridesmaids. Lesbians. I was like, I love to say lesbian whenever I possibly can. Um, so I was like, don't take that label away from me. Right. I, I'm trying to cling to this like new identity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's our, it's our prerogative. Yes. Susan, Susan, you've had uh, your hand up. Actually, I don't have a question. Um, it was oh, no, for no, uh, Professor talking. Diamond, but um, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, I'm probably one of the older people here um, and you know, I'm 62. So I had to repress well, first, first of all, my parents never talked about anything with me, never. And so I grew up in a very closed family. And you mean so about your being born intersex? Intersex, yes. Okay. They never discussed it with me until I was 15. And anyway, um, and I feel like um, it's really difficult because I, I've known that I've had attraction to women for decades. And, but because everything's been repressed because of my hardcore family, um, it feels like, oh my gosh, do I really want to take on more stigma in my life on top of other things that I have? I don't know if anyone else can relate to that. Like, do I want, I don't, I think that that shapes my not wanting to label myself. It changes not wanting to label yourself. Is that what you said? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the beauty of it, is that it, it, it can. 
mm -hmm. can't be that way. I think the problem is that other people, like, I guess I wouldn't have a problem changing my label every minute, but the problem for me would be other people. Like I would understand my labels, um, but other people wouldn't. And that would really bother me. Like, well, you clearly don't know yourself. You clearly don't know what you want. You're back and forth and you're back and forth. Well, I think you bring up a good point, Julia, because I found myself in this training for work, which is how I came out. It was this diversity training we had. And I decided that was when I was just gonna say, I identify as a gay, queer woman, <laughs> whatever. And um, because it was hard to figure out when do I come out at work? I mean, I don't really want to stand up. But in that training and when we were talking about it and I thought, you know, once you start identifying in that sort of queer, vague area, you realize like for people who are heteronormative, they don't, like there's a lot assumed and people aren't focused on their sex. They're not really concerned. I mean, if you're from the Midwest, most of the older women in the Midwest, they look transgender or they look gay. Uh -huh. My grandmothers were, especially one of them, like by these standards that we have set, but because they were in this heteronormative, like living that way, it wasn't questioned. Mm -hmm. So my point being that what other people think to hell with that, does it matter who I go home to at the end of the day when I'm doing my job at work? And I think that's sort of the paradigm where we have to get to and that people's assumptions, oh, well, she's gay or she's straight no, like we're people and you can treat us all like people with our full dignity intact. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, growing up in the 70s and 80s, I feel like there was a little more fluidity as far as like how we dressed. Um, I mean, if I look back, like, I think it's funny when people say, look, I was gay and I can do it. I've got my third grade picture. I'm wearing a blazer and I had short hair but I wanted to look like Princess Diana. She had short hair yeah. and I was in love with Duran Duran boys who all had makeup on and looked like girls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, it's, like it's this mean, pol the polarizing that is happening in our country. Yeah, and so you I think- to pick, You have to pick a camp, right? Politically, you have to pick a camp. Religiously, uh, pro-choice or pro-life, like everybody just, that's way it seems it's going. Um, I don't think you do when you're straight. I think straight people actually get away with a lot more fluidity appearing than um, it's once you get into like queer area where suddenly you're boxed in. I don't know. I see a lot of straight people who cross over in all sorts of ways that aren't questioned. Mm -hmm. I think, um, well, I think, I think it's interesting, the intersection between the social, the historical um, social idea that Dr. Diamond was um, brought up with, which I thought was really interesting, that labels derived from a sense of wanting people to have something to identify with to be, then to be affirmed by the community at large, um, to see, but to see now how that's evolved and the intersection between the, the, the religious and the social constructs and the sexual orientation and the gender, um, the, 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 the gender constructs. I think it's fascinating because we ourselves, I feel often for myself anyway, and I, I've heard other people talk about wanting to identify as something. I want to identify as something because then I can be a part of a group. I can find who my people are. Um, and then, uh, but then it's so hard because it gets blurry with, th these are all like existing things at the same time, right? It gets blurry with what, what is my label? And then also how do other people see me and understand me? And so I just had my one, one year of really coming out. Um, and during this entire year, the thing that keeps coming to my mind is, I just want to do what feels good. And if it feels right, I mean, as long as you're not like being a dick and killing somebody or whatever, like don't be a dick, but if it feels good, then that's, 
that's okay. And why does it have to be a certain thing? You know, mm -hmm. why does it have says move towards the warmth, move away from the cold and move towards the warmth. And you just, yeah. yes. Live in your and, and, yeah. And this, this idea that, that, that these things are fluid, that it would, if we as a society, the impacts of that, if we moved away from that, we were able to drop these labels, these things, right? And just be, mm -hmm. just be with ourselves and then just be with each other, just to accept each other. I mean, it just kind of blows my mind, yeah. you know? I think other people don't, I'm, I'm, I'm like di dissing other people tonight, which I don't mean to do. There's a lot of other great other people out there, but other people want us, if we question our identity, then that kind of fucks with their head. This is, this is what I, I mean, right. we've experienced this, what I think. It's like, I make a change in my life that affects somebody else because maybe they want to make the same change and they're afraid. Maybe they, um, they the people with the most judgments, it's, it's really, it's so much about them. Jane, you had your hand up, so I want to go. Yes, please. Um, one. Um, what I wanted to say was, most transgenders and intersex people know at an early age, I mean, really young, that they are that gender. Mm -hmm. People back then, when I grew up in the 60s and 70s, say, no, 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 you're just confused. Well, that's why we had to suppress that to almost where it was almost killing us that, to that point. You as most of the transgenders, and they would tell you they have done what they call man up to get uh, to prove, to show uh, what they call normal society. We're not that way until they uh, almost where they almost kill themselves and they come out to the point where either I'm going to live my true life or I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. And I have done that. I have done that three times said, I'm either going to kill myself tonight or I'm going to come out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When she said that, I'm sure, Jane, that it hit you too, when she said about the parents that she's working with now, researching that, that you know, really it comes down to losing their child. It yes. comes, for, for the parent, it comes down to what is, what's the ultimatum? I mean, the ultimatum here is I'm going to lose, I could lose my child. Okay, now I'll, and, and that's, that's sounding judgy, but, but you're absolutely right. It's, it's, um, Emily, okay. Had, okay. it's, uh, it's like, the death. It's, it's, and, and that, and, and the fact that we have to get to that point to death or close to death before, um, something changes in our, in our, um, brain. Um, I just want to get, like I have four parents, four children it. now, mm -hmm. and I have told my girls, if you want to come out, even as a turn uh, a tomato, I will uh, identify you as a tomato. <laughs> I'll slice you up and eat you on a nice BLT. <laughs> yes, Thank that's you. very loving. I I'll, embrace your, I'll embrace your tomato ness. No, but um, I mean, I did that with my own kids without realizing it. I was careful about pronouns when they were younger. I made sure they knew they could love who they loved and whoever mm -hmm. they loved, we would love them. Mm -hmm. My ex-husband said I went a little overboard with what he called the gay thing. <laughs> but I mean, because I did want them to know if they wanted to be a tomato, we'd have to let them be a tomato, as you say. <laughs> right. Because at the end of the day, we still love that tomato. Yeah. And I think yeah. the fear of parents on the flip side, the parents who are rejecting their children and who do get to that point until they see, oh my gosh, my child might take their own life. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they're afraid. They're afraid. I mean, I know in the Mormon religion, I have talked to people who say they're afraid. It's the afterlife. That's a huge fear. I, it's, I struggle to relate to it because mm -hmm. I don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. But I can only imagine if I believed in this afterlife of eternity yeah. with my family, yeah. not being together I and by allowing my child to be what they want to be a tomato that that child's not going to be with us, I would be terrified. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, um, 
Uh, we're, I'm going to say Emily, I think Emily raised your hand. And then after Emily, I'm going to stop recording. I'll leave it going, but I'll, I'll, I need to, I'll need to hop off. But if whoever wants to stay on and chat about anything. Um, thanks, Amelia. Bye, Amelia. Um, Bye. Was it Emily? Who raised their hand? Like physically, I thought, saw somebody raise their hand. No? No? no. Okay. Well, I'm going to post it. So if you want to watch it again or share it with someone um it'll be posted but what a great sized group um i really appreciate um everybody being here live it just it's nice to have a lot of interesting um faces for um the guests and i was thrilled that she could join us so mm -hmm. so thank Julia, you Julia. before you go mm -hmm. just ask yourself uh, of the parent those in our group that are parents when you had your child, the only thing you want that child to have is be healthy, mm -hmm. happy, and have all their fingers and all their toes. Boy, is that true? Right? Mm -hmm. If they came out as gay, lesbian, bi, queer, or intersect, or get transgender, now, why do you care now? When you only thing you didn't care back then. Good right? point. That's a great point. That's yeah. a and it's because we we're human beings and we live in a society that we care what people we, we care what people think or at least what people think affects us it affects us politically it affects our rights it affects our safety um so yeah i mean i wish we could i i, I wish i could turn that off i wish i could not be affected by by the, the truth of you know, well, we can. it's getting better. It's getting better. I mean, it's just, it's getting better. Yeah. Amy. I think it is getting better. I, I, I can't explain my hesitation. So I haven't said anything because I, I can't quite articulate it, but I think it's, it is a political concern, political in the sense of, um, in that sort of postmodern idea where we kind of follow our hearts and follow our minds and we, um, the story changes as we change and as we grow that feels really beautiful to me um, personally and, and for society. But my concern is in some ways, these sort of titles or these um, labels, if you will, have been important for like asserting ourselves as a group of people who need and deserve rights and need and deserve, you know? And so I, I think there, there is just this, I, and I can't, I'm, like I said, I can't quite articulate it. Maybe someone else is having a similar reaction, but um, but it, it's sort of like to identify as gay, to identify as queer, to identify as a lesbian, to identify in ways that are not majority culture. Um, if we kind of lose that, like, is there any power we lose with that? And just a little piece of me hesitates and worries a smidge. I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm I don't know if anyone else is feeling that, but that's a great yeah. point. I, I, that's um, point. I uh, how do we change the narrative to so that the people that we're fighting, you know, that we can fight for this space without forcing these boxes? So, like, um, how do we change? Here's my how do we get the the patriarch to recognize? without be you know them recognize it without those boxes yeah um and yeah. i think that's a really important and how do we change this as advocates and as activists how do we change that narrative to get yeah. them to respect it and respect our fight um yeah. because it's them it's just like as a white person it's my fight for to recognize what's wrong with systematic racism how do we get the heteronormative to view that in that same way, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I think the hetero heteronormative culture has to change. Yeah. And the lawyers and the policymakers, that would be an interesting discussion to have with them because oh, yeah. the strategies they use sometimes cling to these archaic ideas. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, um, the dominant culture has to change. Yeah. And, and yes, we wipe out, I don't want to wipe out what um, our early, you know, I think about like Laura in the group who, you know, we all respect for coming out when she came out at 18 and South Texas and the work that 
are uh, the, the, you know, the people that have gotten us here so that we can be here and be out and be, um, you know, relatively safe. I don't think everyone feels, not everybody is safe, but maybe more so than, than uh, 30, 40 years ago. Um, but I don't want to dismiss what they've done, you know, by just saying, it's sort of like saying color, um, I don't see color. You can't say you don't see color because that dismisses color. the injustices. <laughs> it, it's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, it, I get, I get the point. I get the, I get the point, like we're all equal, we should, but no, 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 no. Um, and it's the similar with this. It's like, I get the yeah. point of not wanting labels, but then how do we do that? So anyway, you all talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to stop recording. Um, I'm going 